Hello everyone and welcome to another exciting episode of Day Spring Discussions. I'm your host, Sean McGahee, and this is a show where we talk about movies, TV, sci-fi, fantasy, comic books. If you geek out about it, we're going to talk about it. I am joined on this beautiful afternoon, looks like it's finally getting warmer out there today, by the ever so elegant Miss Lisa Locke McGahee. Hello. All right, guys, so if this is the first time tuning in, here's how it's going to go. I'm going to run down some stories in regards to DC and Marvel, and then uh, move on to some Star Wars, possibly Harry Potter, and miscellaneous news. Lisa and I are then going to discuss it, and then you chime back on social media. Let me know what you think. So, Lisa, you ready to rock? Sure am. All right, guys, we got a lot to talk about. Uh, some good stuff that came out within this last mm -hmm. week. So, starting off, I don't have any Marvel news, so we're going to jump right into DC. Got a couple of DC stories. And starting off, the always questionable story is going to be about Ben Affleck and the Batman movie. So... Um, ben Affleck was talking to The Guardian about his recent film, Live by Night, that comes out, I think, next week uh, nationwide. It's in select theaters now. But anyway, of course, the subject of the Batman movie came up that he is set to write, direct, and star in. Now, he said um, a few months back, he talked about how the script was coming along. He's co-writing with um, Inter uh, DC Entertainment president and CCO Jeff Johns on it. And uh, everything was, you know, coming along, possibly going to be shooting next year, all this other stuff. Well, from comments he's made, things might not be going that smoothly now. So in a quote, he said, that's the idea, but that's not a set thing and there's no script. If it doesn't come together in a way I think is really great, I'm not going to do it. Now, the Guardian went on to ask him uh, why he actually chose to be Batman. And he said the main reason he did was course for his son he said sam thinks his dad is batman it's an incredible feeling everyone wants to be a superhero to their son so this of course the the way he was quoted in this interview brings up uh kind of questions as to some people because a few months ago it was said that the batman movie or the script for the batman movie was coming along and that dc and warner brothers was trying to fast track the film and just you know trying to push it so much as even set, um, put aside Justice League 2 and, you know, get Batman, the Batman film going. From this, it's kind of the idea that there might be some setbacks in regards to the Batman film and maybe Ben Affleck's involvement in it. Um, for me, there's, there's several possibilities in here. Um, first off, of course, uh, probably the most obvious one is that Everything's fine. You know, that, yeah, there are some issues with the script or whatever, but, you know, he's working through them and everything's going fine. Number two, um, too many cooks in the kitchen and Warner Brothers is trying to give their two cents to their uh, leading man, director, slash star. And it's caused some controversy. And then number three, in regards to the writing, uh, could be a possible controversy or difference of opinion between Ben Affleck and Jeff Johns. Out of the possibilities, Lisa, which one do you think is more uh, possible? I think that DC is a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because a few months ago, like I said, they said everything was coming along. They wanted to push the movie through. They were all excited about it because of how people responded to Ben Affleck as Batman. And now his quotes, I mean, people are saying that Affleck is pretty much trying to send a message to somebody with this quote. And he's like saying, well, you know, he was all about it before. But now he's like, hey, if it's not right, I'm not going to do it. And he's sending a message to, you know, Warner Brothers or DC or, you know, whoever. But something is not all right in the land of DC. Definitely. Well, I mean, I think that's true for, like, him. I mean, I think if the script isn't good, I don't think he's going to do it. So, I mean, if there's creative differences yeah. already and he wants to go in one direction and the powers that be there are pushing him in a different direction, I, I believe he'd walk. Yeah, I believe it too. And you know, we uh, we talked, I think it was a few weeks ago, I talked about how I feel like Warner Brothers would give him a lot more leniency because of his um, current credits as far as, um, you know, one winning, like Oscar winning act, uh, director, and he's got also another Oscar for writing Good Will Hunting all those years ago, and he's got, he's in good uh, graces with Warner Brothers, so I figured they, I figured they would give him a little more free reign and trust him a little more. And I disagreed with and, you. Exactly. And, and now I am continuing. you might actually be right about this, possibly. Well, I mean, I'm not saying that they won't give him a little more leeway. I think if he, like, legit says, if you don't let me do what I want to do, I'm going to walk, mm -hmm. they might have a second thought. But I think if 
if it comes down to he says, this is what I want, and they're like, no, this is what we want, and he's like, okay, I'm going to walk, I think they'll be like, fine, deuces, we'll find someone else. Uh, but that's the thing, too, is they say they find someone else, but then do you think he walks away as Batman? Yeah, I think he would. I think he walked away from being an actor, too, in the, in the part. I think he would. Yeah? Wow. That'd be something. I mean, if if Ben Affleck came out tomorrow and said, uh, yeah, I'm not going to be Batman past Justice League, Everyone, there would be, that's the biggest red warning ever as far as the entire slate for mm -hmm. DC properties. Because not only have they changed their slate so many times from that initial, you know, um, announcement of when the films are, what films are doing, but, you know, having the guy that people trust most out of, you know, mm -hmm. acting and directing and writing and says, nope, I can't work with these people, I'm gone, mm -hmm. that's like, you know... Sound the sirens and let's, you know, yeah. abandon ship and everything. Well, he doesn't like to be in bad movies. I mean, he used to do all those <laughs> he wasn't shit in movies. Bad movies. That's what I mean. And I don't think he wants to go back there. And no. I, I don't think he liked, I'm sure he did not like what people were saying about Batman v Superman uh -huh. after all was said and done. And that's why he wanted to have more creative control. Yeah. In the, in the Batman standalone. And if they're not going to let him have that creative control, he doesn't want to be in another in another critically, you know, critical bomb like yeah. that. Oh, they announced the, the, the Razzies and both Suicide Squad and Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice got nominated for Worst Picture. <laughs> and it's weird because with the Razzies, usually it's like, you know, five or six films. There was like a dozen films that were nominated. And I'm like looking to list and I'm like, these were all crap movies. So I really can't can't go against the fact that, you know, 2016 was a crap year, including for movies. Go for it. Okay, she's going to go blow her nose. <laughs> uh, step away just for a minute, guys. Um, yeah, this is just another line of DC warning bells. I mean, with the, the trouble they're having with the Flash movie and the reshoots they had on Suicide Squad from, you know, the way they say that they've changed um, tones as to what Justice League is going to be. This is just another line of things that everyone's saying what this franchise needs is a leader. They need that Kevin Feige. They need that Kathleen Kennedy. Someone who says, okay, this is my vision. This is how it's going to go. Let's just follow it through and we'll hit maybe a couple of bumps along the way, but we'll see it through and it'll work. And they just, they don't have that person is what it is. Some people think Zack Snyder was it. Some people think Ben Affleck's it. Some people think that Jeff Johns is the new leader. We don't know. That's just, we have no idea. I don't think they know either. They don't, they don't know either because that's been the problem too. They're so reactionary. I mean, they were set to come out with their cinematic universe years ago with Green Lantern, but because it got poor reception, they abandoned it and they you know they for many years until Man of Steel came along. Um and, you know, started off with that. So which I think was a mistake. Yeah, you had one bad film, but if you had a good idea as far as moving forward, you should have seen it through. But it could be the fact that again they don't have any idea as to what they're doing. So and in any event, we'll just have to wait and see how it goes. Um, but uh, again, just not a good sign for nope. the upcoming DC films. But speaking of possibly some good DC programming coming our way, uh, we just got a couple trailers for the upcoming NBC show Powerless. And it premieres Thursday, February 12th, or excuse me, February 2nd on NBC. Now, this is a show that takes place in the DC universe. But it's a comedy. It stars Vanessa Hutchins and Alan Tudyk. And they're working for the company Wayne Security, which is an offshoot of Wayne Enterprises. And their company, what they do is they protect people from superhero disasters. You know, superheroes and supervillains are flying around, causing a bunch of destruction. And what Wayne Security's job is, is to think about the little guy. With In the trailer you saw... Uh, what is it, a rubble umbrella that protects people from rubble flying down below and a security suit where you can take a punch, all this other stuff. Now, in the official synopsis for the show, it says, quote, In a world where humanity must cope with the collateral damage of superheroes and supervillains, Emily Lott, played by Hutchins, begins her first day as Director of Research and Development for Wayne Security, a subsidiary of Wayne Enterprises that specializes in products that make def uh, defenseless bystanders feel a little safer. Full of confidence and big ideas, Emily quickly learns that her expectations far exceed those of her new boss, played by Tudyk, and office mates. So it will be up to her to lead the team toward their full potential and realize that you don't need superpowers to be a hero. 
Uh, Lisa, you just saw the two trailers that came out. What do you think? I mean, this show, do you think it might be good? When, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a superhero show, but it's not. It's set in a superhero world, but it's a comedy. I mean, I thought the trailer looked cute. Yeah. I mean, until we see the first episode and get kind of a feel for what it's really going to be like. I mean, I, I definitely think it has potential from... Mm -hmm. I mean, the trailer made me interested. Yeah. I wasn't... I mean, I wasn't immediately, like, turned off by it. I, I, I would... I'd watch it, see yeah. how it goes. Yeah, I mean, this is one show they've, they've actually teased this for a while. They first announced this um, last spring or something like that. And they've kind of been putting off showing people more of it. I don't know if they went through a couple of uh, changes or what exactly was going on. Um, but I'm definitely interested. I'm, I'm very curious the fact that it is set in the DC world, and uh, it's Wayne Security that they're working for. So it's, you got to ask yourself, are we going to have appearances by you know Bruce Wayne or other superheroes or anything like that? I would think they're going to try not to. Try not to, because especially the fact that not only what they're doing in the films, but also what the CW is doing as well mm -hmm. um, with all their heroes. But I could, see, I could definitely see them being mentioned, Perhaps, but not maybe showing them. Uh, but I think I could see other smaller, uh, lesser known heroes kind of showing up or popping in or something like that. But yeah, I thought it looked cute. Um, I'm, of course, Alan Tudyk. No I question know. there. Anything he's in. No question there. Uh, Vanessa Hutchins. I've only seen her in two things. One was, well, partially I tried to watch High School Musical 3 uh, many years ago and I got the first 15 minutes of it and I turned it off because it was totally ridiculous. Uh, the second thing was Sucker Punch, which was a Zack Snyder mess, in nonetheless. So I'm not really too familiar with her. Yeah, I've never seen her um, anything. So I'm curious how she's going to do as a leading lady in this comedy. We'll just wait and see if uh, she's got the acting jobs. But I love the the idea of it, you know, where it's these people that their job is to come up with stuff to help people, um, you know, defend themselves. When buildings come crashing down and cars are being flipped down the highway or whatever, you know. The, the, the bystanders in a superhero battle that you see in all these movies. You know, you see all the destruction. Like, Man of Steel, you saw Metropolis getting torn apart. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta have people that help protect the people as well. So the concept, the concept itself, I thought, was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. But we'll have to wait and see how it goes. So, cool. Alright, so, uh, moving on to our last piece of DC news today. Uh, actor Matt Ryan has played John Constantine in several interpretations, or several versions of the character... The first was a uh, TV show, live action, on NBC. It lasted 13 episodes before it was canceled. Then he came back and did a guest star on the show Arrow as John Constantine as well. And then he's actually going to be uh, voicing the character in an upcoming Warner Brothers animated direct-to-DVD movie, Justice League Dark. Well, it was just announced that he's actually going to get another chance to play the character in a Constantine animated series coming on the CWC. Now, for those of you who don't know, the CWC is a kind of an, a, a website that you can see offshoot uh, CW or Warner Brothers shows. Um, but the main, one of the main reasons I've watched it or know about the website is because they've showed the animated show Vixen. Now, what it is, it's like, I think they're like six-minute episodes. They're like, uh, like ten six-minute episodes or something along that line. I know when you added up the first season of Vixen, it was only like 31 minutes long. Um, but yeah, it's still part of the Greg Berlanti Arrowverse, actually, but it's animated. So this is another show that they're adding to the Arrowverse, so to speak. Now, Jeff Johns last week was teasing about them adding another show to the CW DC um, shared universe. Whether this is it, I mean, it hasn't really been confirmed, but I guess you could say it might be. But anyway, Constantine would be executive produced by Greg Berlanti, the guy who has been doing doing all the, the superhero stuff on the CW. And it's going to be written by David S. Goyer, who um, wrote the Blades uh, series and also helped write the Dark Knight trilogy as well. Now, for those who don't know, John Constantine was a character based off DC and Vertigo comics who deals heavily in the mystic arts and the battle between heaven and hell and all that. Blah, blah, blah. So, <laughs> Lisa, um, I know you're not familiar with any of the other stuff. The Constantine. Did you ever see the Keanu Reeves movie? I have. I've seen so it. So you know the character. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I didn't love the movie, but Keanu Reeves is not known for doing, like, super stellar work in general. I, I still enjoyed it. I mean, I thought it was all right. Mm -hmm. I didn't hate it, but it's, <laughs> I didn't love it. But, I mean, I don't, I don't like the character enough to really care that much yeah. about this. 
I think it's just interesting that they're adding another layer to, again, expanding that that DC universe. Because we just sit here, we, we, we bitched and complained about how Warner Brothers is handling their DC properties in the films, but I love what they're doing on TV, you know, mm -hmm. especially on the CW with Arrow and The Flash and Supergirl. And I like the, the Vixen, the Vixen animated um, series. I liked as well. They're in season two right now. You can check it out on CW Seed. And they have, of course, the guys doing the voices. So like Flash and Arrow guest star. And it's Stephen Amell and Grant Gustin doing the voices. Um, where do they have uh, the Adam and um, Brandon Ralph does the voice for him. So it's part of the same universe, but it's animated so they can get away with doing, you know, bigger mm -hmm. action pieces and stuff like that. Constantine is a character. I'll admit I did not watch the series when it was on because it didn't look that interesting. I like the film, I like the character, and I'm interested definitely to see the Justice League Dark animated movie coming out. Um, so I'm really, again, it's with the animated series, you have a little more room to play as far as, you know, far out concepts and action sets and all that stuff because you don't have to worry about CG effects and the money it costs and all that. So, yeah, I'm definitely interested to check out this animated uh, series on CW Seed and really just see what they do with it. And again, adding that other layer to the Arrowverse. I think it'll be cool. Whether that will maybe hopefully spark interest in bringing Constantine either back as a guest star in the Arrow or Flash or Supergirl, one of those shows, or even bringing the show back. Because when the show started, it wasn't a part of um, the Arrowverse. It was on NBC, and they said, hey, they're just separate. So kind of like you had Flash and Arrow, and then you had Constantine and Gotham, which... All those two shows had nothing to do with Flash and Arrow. Maybe that was kind of their mistake to begin with. Um, if you threw Constantine in there, maybe it would have survived a little more. Maybe this will spark some interest in reviving it. We'll just have to wait and see. Is there somebody like who has like creative control over the DC shows? Like, is that is there one person that kind of has that strategic so, vision? Is that what's working with the show? So you or? have. Um, you have Jeff Johns, who is the DC Entertainment president. So he's kind of in charge of, you know, the, both, not really in charge, but like he's supervising both the movies and the TV. Like he's heavily involved, I know, in as far as producing for The Flash and Arrow and stuff like that. He's written a couple episodes, I know as well, um, of Flash and Arrow too. Uh, so he's one of them, I think, that's overseeing everything. Um, but not the main. So there isn't like no. a Kevin Feige that's over no. the TV no. stuff. No, it's not like we're because um, I know in um, in the Marvel sense they have Jeff Loeb, who who oversees the TV division of Marvel. So he's overseeing the Netflix shows as well as Agents of Shield, uh, the animated series, all that stuff. So I'm not one hundred percent what I know. No one's really seen. I mean, Greg Berlanti is in charge of his universe though. He's Flash, Supergirl, Arrow, Legends Tomorrow, Vixen. He's in charge of that stuff. So this would fall, again, they said he's execu executive producing, so this falls under his banner. But as far as who makes the calls as to what goes where and what gets incorporated into what, I'm not sure. The way Berlanti's going, I wouldn't be surprised if he steps up and... Well, I just wondered that. if that if there was someone who was kind of... Maybe that's why their TV universe is working, when their movies are not. Well, yeah, I mean, and when I say, of course, their TV universe, the, I'm talking about the shows I just mentioned, because they have Berlanti there as a cohesive voice between the five shows. Uh, just, you know, again, he much like Feige with the Marvel um, movies, he's got an idea of how everything blends together and how... It, so the answer idea. to my original question was yes. <laughs> yes, but not in... Like, he's not there at DC saying... He's not the guy who get, who gets to say, okay, we're going to give this guy a show. We're going to give this guy a show. He's going to give you a guy who's going to be like, hey, can I use Constantine? Or, hey, can I use, you know, the, the Adam or whatever like that? He still has to ask permission for the things he wants into his universe. Mm -hmm. So he's not the big head honcho who, who makes decisions or pitches ideas, I guess. But Okay. Anyway. All right, guys. So uh, that's enough with the DC news. We're going to step into a little subject that I think is probably going to take most of the time, as it usually does, and that's going to be Star Wars news. Now, before we get into uh, some Rebel action here, uh, Variety is reporting that Woody Harrelson is in talks to play the mentor figure in the Han Solo spinoff film starring Alden Ehrenreich. Uh, nothing's really been confirmed. It's kind of just rumors at this point, uh, but there is good sources from what I've told, one of them, of course, being Variety, that uh, this is in talks. 
the film also stars Donald Glover as Lando Calrissian and also Game of Thrones' Amelia Clark in an undisclosed part at this point as well. Phil Lord and Chris Miller, who brought us films such as The Lego Movie and 21 Jump Street, are set to direct. Lauren Kasdan and John Kasdan, his son, are set to write the, excuse me, write the script. And the film will be focused on a young Han Solo and how he became a smuggler, thief, and scoundrel before he met Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi in the cantina at Mos Eisley. <laughs> I say cantina, of course, because that was one of the questions I missed last night mm -hmm. on the Star Wars Trivial Pursuit, which I'm still kicking myself for that. I'm kicking myself for that Captain Panaka one. That's what it was. That was what I really, really regret on that. But in any event, the Han Solo film is set to come out uh, May 25th, 2018. And also another character I forgot to mention that they said is going to be in it is going to be Chewbacca. And while it's unconfirmed, it's likely that Jonas Sutamo, and I screwed that up, will be reprising his role as the Wookiee who played Chewbacca in The Force Awakens when Peter Mayhew was unable to do such tasks. I'm not exactly sure, but... In any event, Woody Harrelson uh, becoming a kind of a mentor, the, the father figure, so to speak, for young Han Solo. What do you think? I think Woody Harrelson is good at everything he does. See, so. and that's the thing I was thinking about. Because first, it's like when I first thought about it, I was like Woody Harrelson. And when you think of Woody Harrelson, the first thing that comes to my mind is his comedy, his you know, his white man can't jump, his cheers, stuff like that. But then I could, thought about his more recent stuff, such as um, his role in the TV show True Detective. And uh, there was another film he did. Uh, it was Christian Bale. Uh, what's the name of it? I totally forget. But anyway, he he. When you look at his his portfolio of all the films and stuff he's done, he's got a lot of range, actually, from mm -hmm. comedy to drama. And then he's going to play uh, the villain in the new uh, Planet of the Apes film, which looks really good as well. So that's giving me that darker edge, too. I think it's great. Um, I was just thinking about it. And you got to think of it from the perspective of Han Solo. Okay, So say he's going to play the mentor to Han Solo. And you think about who Han Solo is, you know, the scoundrel and the, the thief and all that stuff. And you got to think... He, you know, who he learned that all from has to be quite the um, character. character, so to speak. And I think when you look at that, again, when you look at Woody Harrelson's, you know, portfolio, um, I can definitely see him pulling off a, something, a character like that. Uh, I would compare him a lot to uh, his character he did in um, uh, Zombieland, mm -hmm. uh, kind of like that. That'd be uh, kind of the way I would sway towards it. But in any event, I never thought of Woody Harrelson as being in a Star Wars movie, but... You know, he's a he's a great great actor, so I think he'll be a fine job if it turns out to be true. Still, nothing set in stone yet, but uh, there's some heavy rumors going uh, for it. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. So let's get on to probably the main event of this episode. Oh, uh, Star Wars or Lucasfilm has released a mid-season trailer for the second half of Star Wars Rebels season three, which. Uh, airs on Disney XD. Now, some of the highlights of this trailer include an appearance by Saw Gerrera, who is voiced by Forrest Whitaker, the same man who played him in Star Wars Rogue One. We also see um, the Mandalore and Sabine going back home with the dark saber, and looks like kind of trying to rally the Mandalorians or uh, lead them, but maybe being tested as well as far as her, um, her leadership skills. Uh, we also see the Rebellion leader Mon Mothma finally make an appearance in the series. Uh, we see Grand Moff Tar uh, excuse me, um, Grand Admiral Thrawn uh, kind of kicking some butt, doing some little training there, and kind of voicing that it's time for him to make his move against the Rebels and that he will show them no mercy. And in one of the scenes, we also saw him with the uh, Black Death Troopers, which appeared in Rogue One as well. But of course... The main highlight from this trailer is at the very end. Obi-Wan. When we saw Obi-Wan sitting by the fire, Darth Maul shows up right behind him, and then Obi-Wan draws his lightsaber. I think we've all agreed that that's pretty much going to be probably the season finale. They're going to string us along mm -hmm. this whole time until then. So, um, now the first episode of the second half of the season aired Saturday. Lisa and I watched it last night. It was the one with Saw Gerrera in it. Um, so we're going to kind of go back and forth here between the latest episode and the trailer. Uh, give me a sense, Lisa, what do you think about, you know, the episode we saw, but also the trailer and how you think it's all going to go from here on. I mean, I like the episode. I, I like the episode a lot. I, I, I'm not a big fan of Saw, though. Like, I, I he, 
So I mean, I don't like his methods. I don't like, and especially after having seen Rogue One and really kind of getting and reading the book too, like he's kind of a dick. He is. And so I'm not a big. I mean, I I'm not a big fan of him in general. I don't like him. I don't like his methods. I don't like his. I mean, I get that he's got a lot of anger and hostility built up, and I, yeah, sure, you know, from what I saw of him in the Clone Wars too, like he has reason to to be upset and angry, but. Yeah, I'm. I I really I'm. I'm not a fan, and I'm still. I'm, I'm also a little bit confused with timeline. Mm-hmm. So in Rogue One, I feel like he's a lot older than he is mm-hmm. in this Clone War or this uh, Rebels episode, and it's not that much. It's about two years away from what. Yeah, I'm like I feel like the way that Rogue One made it seem like they made it seem like he'd made their break from the rebellion, like a long time ago, and yeah. here it's like. Two years or something, yeah. and that doesn't make any sense. It's got to be more than two years. Well, it's like, well, because they said, because, okay, so Rebels starts... I mean, Ezra's the same age as Luke and Leia, right? Yes. And he's only, he's 15 when Rebels starts. Yeah, so so Rebels is supposed to start five years before A New Hope, which we now know is pretty much the same time that Rogue One is. So right, same, we're but five. we're only maybe a year or two in, right? We're season three, so if you gotta... Do you if, think they're making it, it year for year? I, I don't think I would that assume, they are. I would assume so, honestly. Oh, I don't I mean, think that they are. I could see Ezra being 17 at this point. Oh, so. I wasn't thinking. Well, that's still three, but even so, like, I just don't see, the timeline doesn't make sense to me. That was so my biggest frustration what, with the what episode. Doesn't make, when I first saw him in the trailer, what doesn't make sense to me is the fact that we are so close and the shape we saw him yeah. in Rogue One. He was like, you know, he, had, he needed a breathing apparatus. He was in bad shape. But in this episode, he was, he was pretty good. And I watched the uh, the Collider guys talk about it um, last night in regards to Saul. First off, um, when you look at his character, both in the Clone Wars and Catalyst and Rebels, and you kind of just follow his timeline um, you haven't watched, you're not, yeah, you're not caught season five where they mentioned in Rebels when he lost his sister. I saw that. You saw that episode? That already happened. I thought it was in season five. It, it's the beginning. Under okay. already okay. happened. I okay. saw all that. Okay, okay, yeah. So yeah, he lost his sister and they were talking about how this character, how, you know, when you meet him in Rogue One, he's a beaten, better guy who, I mean, not also in Rebels too, where he, you know, he's lost so much and he keeps losing and losing and losing and he'll do anything at this point for a win, I guess mm-hmm. is what they were trying to say. Um, but another thing I thought was interesting was one thing again I commented on is about how good a shape he looked from where yeah. he goes from Rebels to Rogue uh, to Rogue One, and they were talking about that one scene there last night where they're fighting um, the, the jet troopers mm-hmm. on the on top of the Ghost, and they start throwing the bombs at him, and there's that one bomb that lands right beside a saw. And uh, Roka was like, oh, I thought that was going to be the moment when it was like, boom, that's when he you know, gets hurt. Mm-hmm. And then he becomes the person we see in Rogue One. But in any event, I, I like the episode. Like I said, I see it's a transition. I liked his, his arc because, you know, again, you start off with Clone Wars. And he is a guy who, you know, was very hopeful and, you know, fighting for a cause he believed in. But all those years of fighting has, you know, just beaten him down is mm-hmm. what it is. And like I said, he's, he wants to win at any cost. Yeah, so I mean, I think that was my only frustration with the episode is I just didn't feel like the saw in that coincided with mm-hmm. the saw we saw in Rogue saw One. We saw. The saw, <laughs> saw we saw. The saw saw in Rogue One. But otherwise, in the episode, I really liked Ezra in the episode. Like, mm. I felt like, you know, because we keep talking about when he's going to go bad and when he's going to go um. turn to the dark side or whatever. But then every once in a while you get an episode like this where I think you really see his good side. You know, his... He's his innocence. Yeah, right? his compassion that he still has. Like, you know, the way he was kind of fighting for Click Clack, you know, and the race. Oh, yeah, you know, I the love whole, that. The whole race I, of the yeah, Genosis. I love like, that. When you have, you know, Saul go in there and he's like, well, you know, he's the enemy. He has information. I'm going to do whatever I have to to get the information. Mm-hmm. But, you know, um, Kanan and Ezra were like, you know, hey, these guys are, you know, essentially a species that is, you know, extinct or mm-hmm. just about to be extinct. And in doing this, it's going to wipe out this race. And then, the, mm-hmm. uh, what is it? Uh, Ezra said something about if we do this, then we're, we're no, no better, better than the, the Empire. Empire. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> but yeah, I think that was one thing I liked about the episode is that it, it showed still that Ezra is still in that he transition. He does have some good he's stuff. Not, he, sure, he, his, his darkness comes out from time to time, but he still, he still has that goodness. And mm-hmm. so I, I like that about the episode. Um, yeah. 
Um, I also loved, probably one of the things I loved about it was uh, Sabine mm -hmm. at the end there, kicking a lot of ass. She had the jetpack. Mm -hmm. She came out, took out the stormtroopers, and uh, lets you know that she's uh, she's pretty badass, actually. Mm -hmm. So, again, makes me more hopeful for what's to come. Yeah. Well, that mid-season so, trailer, too, exactly. with the bits they show with Sabine, where Kanan's kind of teaching her how to use the Darksaber. Yeah. Um, I think that looks like it's going to be awesome. I, well, okay, so we have one episode. I was, I was looking online. I'm, I'm going to get to a theory here in just a, a minute no, or no two. Theories, okay, no, yes. Theories. Yes, yes, no theories. No theories. No theories. Anyway, so... Um, I was looking at the episodes last night, the episode titles on IMDb, and we have one episode that's like Warhead or something like that, and then the next two episodes are have to do with like Mandalore and the Dark Saber. So I think those are the two episodes where Sabine and Ezra go back, um, where we'll see you know the the Mandalore storyline come to fruition, mm -hmm. and I'm excited for that. So that'll be cool. Uh, the Thrawn. People are saying, you know, the, the big thing with uh, Season 3 coming was putting Thrawn, for, going from a Legends character into the new canon. They were really, um, really wanted to see what he could do. But this season, he's kind of been in the background. He really hasn't done much. But he's what, I, learning. what I said, yeah, what I said, excuse me, uh, I think it was last week where I was like, yeah, he's, he's a guy, you know, he wants to study the people. And then when the right time is, he'll make his move. And that's pretty much what he said in this trailer was like, they have made their flaw. It's time for me to make my move. Uh, it was, mm -hmm. it was okay. Um, he also needed to kick the little butt. Mm -hmm. Could uh, could definitely move. So maybe we'll get to see him in maybe some kind of physical fight, perhaps mm -hmm. as well in the season. Yeah, um, I cannot wait to to see Obi Wan. Like I know that you're right. Uh, it's gonna be the last one. I was trying to mention something else here, real quick, before we get to that. Um, oh yes, um, Mon Mothma. We see her. Which is pretty cool. And I think in that shot, they were on the ghost with Mon Mothma. I think Wedge was just sitting there too, actually. So maybe we see Wedge again, which I think is a very um, distinct possibility with that. I, don't, I didn't notice. Okay, Obi-Wan. Let's get into it. So, total surprise. Loved it. I was a little disappointed, though, when I looked it up. Um, James Arnold Taylor, who's been doing the voice of Obi-Wan for Clone Wars and um, at the beginning of Rebels uh, in the message, he does not do the voice of Obi-Wan for this. Cause that's when they when the when the season two when he talked um, in the trailer, it was it was that Alec Guinness um, impression and not an Ewan McGregor impression. And I guess I don't know the guy the guy who does it has been doing several voices for Rebels, uh, but it's not James Arnold Taylor, which again I was a little disappointed with. But um, I like how it does. You know they're trying to get down the Alec Guinness accents uh, because we are closer to A New Hope than we are to Revenge of the Sith, which makes sense in that regard a lot of people have been speculating too of course we assume that they're gonna fight and this is gonna be the end of darth maul once and for all you know clone wars and uh, this season of rebels have all been leading to their final confrontation and they die but <laughs> somebody threw it out there they were like what if they don't fight what if darth maul has been searching for obi-wan because he needs his help even for something i mean it's, it's a crazy theory chances are they're gonna fight or it's gonna be awesome hopefully and Darth Maul is going to meet his final end. Because that's how we, I think a lot of us see Darth Maul finally just being finished in uh, Star Wars lore. Although it's a little disappointing given how they built him up in Clone Wars to such a great character. And also now on Rebels, uh, I'd be a little sad if that was, you know, it for him. It's just, you know, we, he dies there and, you know, that's it. But I can't see him going past A New Hope. What do you think? No, I mean, I think this would be the end of Maul. Mm -hmm. But I think that... It'll, I think I think that Ezra's going to end up on Tatooine, too. You think? I think maybe he... Because he was also looking for Obi-Wan. Yeah. I mean, they both saw Tatooine. They both saw the same place when they had that moment. Mm -hmm. So I think that it'd be cool if Ezra ended up there, too. And, like, it was like a... Like, Ezra and Obi-Wan teamed up to fight Maul. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that'll happen, but I think that that would be cool. I don't know about that. I think Obi-Wan can just... I think Obi-Wan has to do it himself, really. I'm not saying I don't think he can do it himself. I'm saying I think it would be cool as how it ended up. Just because the Ezra got a, had a vision of whatever mm -hmm. that whatever happened of mm -hmm. Tatooine too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it would make sense for them both to end up there. Yeah. They're both yeah. looking for the same place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Ready for my theory? Ready for this? Okay. So here's how Obviously I'm ready, because you were like not even listening to me. You were talking totally about so much. I to totally say what listened you wanted to you. To you had your Ezra, your Darth Maul theory. My theory is better, okay? Whatever. <laughs> so I, again, I was looking at the episodes on IMDb and I saw the air dates for them, okay? And by like mid-February or so, it doesn't look like there's any any breaks up through February. And if they carry on this course, they might be able to get to 22 episodes or whatever around March or April. 
One thing I was thinking would be cool, what if we're at Star Wars Celebration in April and we see the season finale up on the big screen at Celebration? That would be awesome, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But the main theory is Obi-Wan Kenobi in the season finale of Rebels to set up the Obi-Wan spinoff that they announced at Celebration. <laughs> that would be good. My hands are in the air in Celebration right now, yes. That would be cool. Yeah, it would be awesome. Wouldn't it be awesome? And then they bring in Ewan McGregor and you, me, and Nora there and we start flipping out and we're like, ah! Well, I don't know that Nora would flip out. Whatever. But... No, she no. It's just like we were playing the game last night. We were. That's right. We, we were, were being excited. excited, so she was being excited. That's See? true. That's true. I mean, she's gonna be. She's gonna be in it. I think you know. If we prep her for how much her abuela loves Ewan McGregor, that might help. That, her get that excited might help. Too. Yes. How much? How much her grandma loves it? Um, that would just be so awesome. <laughs> that would just be so awesome. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited just thinking about it. See, so so, so now with Nora, you know, we tried to. She knows the characters of Star Wars. She, uh, she's a little hesitant, I think, on getting into the universe. She's still a little young, so it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I mean, she um, she likes, like, she says Darth Vader's her favorite, and she knows the character's name. She chooses yeah. her um, her R2 socks all the time. Yeah, so, but I think when we go to Star Wars Celebration and immerse her in all of it, like, she can do, like, you know, lightsaber training and all the kitty events that they have going on there and stuff like that, I think the Force is going to just overwhelm her, and then I think we're going to have a convert. <laughs> I think it's supposed to happen. Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, she was pretty excited about her little Ray Funko Pop figure that she got. She, I saw that. We put Where did you get that on, from? She got that um, when we were at Dave's. Oh, okay. I, I didn't even know to that. Yeah. Mm, yeah. She, I saw that. She, she, she'd been waiting for it, it was, so she could put it up on her shelf it was with right, her Supergirl. It, it was right next to Supergirl. I walked in this morning. I saw a room like, when did she get that? Christmas. She got it for uh, Christmas. Christmas. Okay, cool. All right. So, yeah, uh, Star Wars Rebels, lots of good stuff coming up, guys. Again, if you're not watching Star Wars Rebels, please get on board, especially if you've enjoyed um, Rogue One and want to learn more about the mythology and you know, all the good stuff that's going on in Star Wars. Um, when is the, the Thrawn book comes out in, what, March or something? I don't know. It comes out sometime in, like, the spring, I believe, is what it is. So that would be cool. But the thing is, they haven't, out, they haven't announced any other books past Thrawn, so I probably that's what we're going to get a celebration. I bet we're going to get a lot of more book announcement at Celebration and stuff like that, as well as a, an announcement for, a, you know, an Obi-Wan spinoff film, of course, starring Ian McGregor. He's going to be there, and he's going to be like, you, you come up on stage. What's up? And he high-fives me, will you come best friend forever? <laughs> so, that's how it's going to go, guys. All right? Anything else as far as Star Wars you want to talk about? Uh, no. I haven't started the Rogue One no um, novel yet. I want to start it today. I liked it. Did you finish it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, as far as what it adds to the characters in the movies, what do you think? Yeah, I thought it I thought it did. I and mean, that's one thing I like about the books um, is they just, especially the books that are already, the, that are the movies made into books, is it just adds a little bit, a little bit bigger dimension because you can, you, you get to see um, what people are thinking. So, like, this one did a lot more in kind of helping you understand, like, what Jin was feeling in relation to discovering her dad being, you know, the whole situation. Mm. Like, there's a lot more of the interplay in her head over how torn she is about whether, how she feels mm -hmm. about her dad. Mm -hmm. I mean, because he basically abandoned her. He did. And she has a lot, like, the movie I don't think did very much to kind of show how she felt about it. And in the book, she's really torn. Like, she really has a frustration. She really hates him, but she really loves him. But she really hates him because he literally abandoned her. And that's, like, that's how she feels. You know, uh -huh. so I think there was a lot. And just even how she feels about Saw, um, th th there's a lot more in-depth um, no. in, in her mind. What's what, I mean, you think about that. Okay, first off, her father abandons her. And then we know from the Saw abandons her too. So well, and her mom, in her yeah. eyes, abandoned yeah. her as well. So she's definitely so she got literally, some... yeah, she has some hardcore abandonment issues. Yeah, and um, so I mean, I think there there was a lot of interesting stuff on that from that respect. You learn a lot more too about um, General Draven. He's like the one who is kind of telling Cassian what to do. Oh, okay, yeah, him. There, there's yeah, a lot. Him. You, you kind of he's he's in it a little bit more, so you kind of get a better sense of who he is and how he works and all the people. In that meeting that they have when she comes to talk mm -hmm. to the to mm -hmm. the um, rebels about oh, the whole the plan, group the whole them. group, you you learn who all those people are that are talking. Okay. In the movie, they don't say their yeah. names, so you learn like who all they are and what their motivations are a little bit more. Um, plus, just the whole thing with you know Krennic. There's a lot more detail mm -hmm. about Krennic and Tarkin and their relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was I I I you know how I am. I yeah. love the books. Yeah. I just think the books they give you so much more about 
you know, because you can do what's going on in people's heads and, and what they're thinking. And I, I, I always think they're worth a read. Mm -hmm. And I thought Rogue One was, the book was good. All right. I can't wait to check it out. Definitely. All right, guys. So stepping off of Star Wars, going into miscellaneous news. Uh, these next two or these last two stories, Lisa might not have a lot to mention, but the very last one, she'll probably have just as much as I will. But starting off, um, Netflix has premiered a new trailer for season two of Voltron Legendary Defender. So when last we saw the heroes at the end of season one, Emperor Zarkon revealed that he was the original Black Paladin or the original operator of the Black Lion. And then it ended with all the uh, paladins or lions being scattered across the universe, uh, hoping to come back together. Now in this trailer, we show them reunited and uh, pretty much on the run from Zarkon. Now, Lauren Montgomery, the executive producer of the show, talked to Entertainment Weekly a little bit about what we'll get to see in season two. She said, each team member has to start the season dealing with their own problems. They've all been split. We're going to spend a little bit of time tackling problems on their own, but ultimately they do have to come back together in the end. They have to get back into solving the problem at hand, which is Zarkon has enslaved the large portion of the universe. Now, with the trailer, they also had the headlines that they're going to add new villains, new worlds, new allies, and uh, the executive producers went on to talk about that and about expanding the universe now and saying that it's really, in expanding these the, the world they have, it's how it's going to set itself apart from the rest of the Voltron um, versions that we've gotten as well. Just saying that there's more out there and the world just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And you have to expand it in order for it to grow and, uh, you know, be more enjoyable. So, um, for me, super, super excited. It premieres January 20th on Netflix and I still got to go back and rewatch season one. I st started with the first episode and then I lost it because... Christmas happened and the holidays happened and stuff that's got really busy. But again, I said this last week when I talked about my, my top things I'm looking forward to in 2017. Go back, rewatch season one or watch season one. It's so awesome. It's a great animated sci fi show. Uh, the characters are great. It expands on the mythology so much from um, what I knew about Voltron, the legendary defender, uh, one of my favorite shows as a kid. Questionable. What I'm questioning really is where. It, of course, they're making it different from other interpretations of Voltron, but how different is really what I want to know. Because in the original series, Voltron Ledger Defender, you had Keith, Lance, Hunk, Pidge, and Sven. Well, Sven got hurt, and then Princess um, Allura took over as one of the, a piloting one of the lions. So in this one, you have Keith, Lance, Hunk, Pidge, and Shiro. But Shiro is like the main guy with the best backstory out of all of them. And I can't see him really going anywhere unless the producers or uh, showrunners are really setting us up for something tragic. That first season two trailer we saw, we saw um, Shiro uh, was talking to Keith. And he's like, Keith, if I don't make it back, you have to lead the Voltron Force. Or something like that. But kind of almost hints at maybe Shiro's not going to make it out of this season alive and maybe that Allura might take over as one of the lions. I don't see that happening given how they set Allura up in her role and her powers in the first season. Um, but we'll just have to wait and see. Again, Shiro is a great character. I don't want to see him go anywhere. Um, overall, with this trailer, I didn't like it at first because they they started out together and of course we know from the end of season one they were separated. They didn't show any of them being separate and how they got back together or anything like that. It just kind of showed them being chased down by Zarkon, which it makes me think that it's going to start off with the same kind of season premiere that a lot of uh, TV shows do where the first episode there you solve all the problems that you had at the season finale and it's all done in one episode and then you move on to the next one, quite possibly. But um, I'm just super excited because this show is great. I love it. Can't wait to watch it again. I uh, might even just stay up all night and binge watch the whole season. I Hopefully not because I'm old and I can't do that anymore. But in any event, guys, uh, check it out before it premieres on January 20th. Okay, moving on. Last story of the day. This is a story really I have nothing really too much to comment on. I'm not sure if Lisa does either. But you know how I like to, you know, try to encompass as much as I can in this show to satisfy anyone and everything that uh, we geek out about. So... Um, 
It has just been announced that The CW is possibly going to do a remake of the television show Charmed. Now, the show Charmed was about uh, three sisters who happened to be witches. It lasted eight seasons and had almost 200 episodes on the WB television network. And this is all according to The Hollywood Reporter. Now, I guess they tried to do a remake several years back uh, on CBS. And the show's original stars, Alyssa Milano and Rose McGowan, uh, didn't actually support it. So it was kind of canceled. But with this new one, they might be going a different angle where it's not set present day, but it's set in 1976. So um, things are still a little murky as far as how the show's going to go or what, uh, what all encompasses in it. But it uh, looks like we might get some more Charmed. I never liked I, the show. I never watched. I never watched one episode. The I only, think I've seen like one or two, but I I, I was not interested. Yeah. It so didn't... so yeah, it's about the, sister, the three sisters who are witches. And I remember when I saw it, I was like, okay, so you got the daughter from Who's the Boss, the daughter from Nine Hundred Two One Zero, and the daughter from uh, Picket Fences, because uh, Shannon Doherty was originally on the show. Mm -hmm. And I guess what happened allegedly was there was a little bit of friction between Shannon Doherty. And Alyssa Milano. And anyone else she's ever been on a Exactly, because the same thing happened with 90210, I guess, between mm -hmm. her and Tori Spelling. So she left. Rose McGowan came on. I don't I don't even know if there was a different character. Yeah, it was a it different was, character. It was, it was, okay. And then they brought in uh, uh, Kaylee Kuko. She was on, like, the last season or something oh, as well. I didn't know that. Um, but, yeah, it lasted eight seasons. It has a pretty big fan base. Um, uh, I never saw the show. Uh, honestly, I have no interest at all. I don't know, well, you know, if you saw the show at all or what you no. thought of it. No, no, no. I no. don't. I have. I never liked the show. The bits I did see, I. No. I maybe no. the CW is just trying to uh, have something different on besides superheroes and mm -hmm. Archie. I don't know. Oh, it's Witch Brother! Yeah, that premieres like in two weeks. The, the the Riverdale. It'll be interesting to watch. You got to watch it just for the sake of checking it out in a, in a comical Fine. sense. Fine, I'll watch the first episode. Yes. All right, you're to get guys. Well, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. That'll be interesting. Uh, but yeah, if you're a Charmed fan, uh, let us know what you think about this news. Let us know why you like the series. Maybe there's something that, uh, perspective that you pick up on that maybe we don't. Uh, hit us up. Let us know. And that's it, guys. That is the show. That's all we got for I thought for you said today. there was the last story we were going to have that so, we were going to want to talk about. The Charmed. The Charmed one, I was like, I said, I don't know if we're going to have much to talk about. Oh, I thought that's you said was. there was something at the end that we were going to want to talk you, about. And you get on me about not paying attention. Jeez. I'm trying, okay. but you put all these TV stories in here, and I don't care about that's, them. Well, you know, I, I know the main thing was uh, Star Wars, so we're going to talk a little about that, mm -hmm. but... All right, any event, um, I will say one thing, though, um, for those of you who don't know, everyone in this household who is over the age of four is a Sherlock fan, and it has started back up again, season four. Uh, they had uh, the second episode of the season was last night. I haven't watched it yet. Lisa has I'm not behind. watched it. Anyway, I was out of town for the fine. first one. Of course, of course. Now, and of course, as we know, with Sherlock, there's usually only three episodes which means the last episode of the season will premiere next Sunday. So I'm planning to do a little bit of a season review okay. on Sherlock. So maybe at least get caught up. It depends on if I get called in this weekend. Okay, we'll see. You know, like I said, only, we'll see. If I do not get called in this weekend, I will catch up. Okay, sounds fair enough. So we'll do some kind of... Uh, a review with that guy. So hopefully Lisa can catch up. We'll bring in her mom because she always has something to say about stuff like this. And uh, we'll go from there. So we'll let you know what we think of that and much, much more on next week's show. So, again, uh, let us know what you think, guys. What do you think about Ben Affleck's comments in regards to the Batman film? What do you think about the Powerless um, uh, TV spots? What do you think about my theory about Rebels introducing the Obi-Wan spinoff film which I will totally geek out about when it happens. All that stuff, let us know. Uh, hit us up on the Facebook group, Twitter, um, the email, dayspringdiscussion at gmail.com. Let us know what you think. Lisa's already all, she's up and she's on her phone and looks like she's definitely done for this episode. So, I guess that means we're going to sign off, guys. So, until next time, may the Force be with us all.